Hey there, Joria here, and welcome to Microsoft Flight Simulator. With the recent release of Microsoft Flight Simulator onto console, I thought now would be the best time than ever to re-go through my setup tutorial on the A32 and X by Flagwire and show you guys how to install it and how to get it going from gate to runway. So in this video, we're going to do just that. Share to install the aircraft, go through a tutorial setup, and see how the aircraft goes from there. The first thing we're going to do is download the A32NX. Now there are two ways to do this, either through the Flybar installer or through the flight simulator itself. On the Flybar installer, you have two options, the A32NX and the A380, which is currently not available and releasing in the future. What you're going to do is download either the stable or development version of the aircraft. It's recommended on PC you use the development version, as while there may be a few small issues here and there, the releases of this are generally quite stable and there's a rigid testing system in place too that prevents any problems appearing. But like I say, you can download stable or development depending on what you prefer. Select what you want, click on install, and the process is done automatically. The second method to download the A32NX is through the Flight Simulator Marketplace. Now this is for those that may not be quite as advanced with installing aircraft add-ons to Flight Sim, and so what you do is from the main menu, head over to the Marketplace, head into the full catalogue, and then just do a search for A32NX. And there you have it, the aircraft needs to download. Nice and simple, all you do is click on Buy. As it's a free add-on, it won't cause any problems with you. Click on Yes, and then the aircraft download from there. One thing also to bear in mind is that you do not select the default A320 Neo, but rather scroll to the right hand side where you will find the A32NX. As this aircraft is separate from the default A320 and is now its own standalone aircraft under flyable air simulations, so scroll to the right and look for the add on aircraft to select. Now that we have the A32NX installed, what I'm going to do is go through a tutorial startup on how to get the aircraft going. It is highly recommended that you have a Simbrief flight plan to go alongside this, and so if you don't know what Simbrief is or you should know how to create a flight plan, click on the eye in the top right corner to go through that video first. What I'm going to do is, my, is use my original flight plan from London Heathrow to Helsinki Vanta and use that for my basis of this flight today. Once you have your flight plan ready to go, now that we're in the cockpit of the A32NX, the first thing you want to do is head over to the overhead panel. Here, we'll turn on both batteries and the external power. What this will do is it will bring all the aircraft's electrical systems to life and put the aircraft through a state of self-test. As you can hear, the alarms bing in the background and the displays are in self-test mode. What it's doing is making sure that everything's working okay or the systems are working as they should before switching over to their primary functions. You can increase the brightness of the PFD, NDs and ECAMs by using the dials on the left and right hand sides and the ECAMs on the centre upper pedestal. Back to the FED panel, what we're going to do now is set the three ADIS to NAV. We're going to arm the crew oxygen supply, arm the emergency lights, turn on automatic the non-smoking signs, set the NAV lights and the strobes to automatic. We're going to leave the fuel pumps and seal up sign in the off position right now, as essentially when the aircraft's fueling up, we don't want to have any passenger straps down in case something were to go wrong. So leave those off for now, those will come on later once the aircraft's been fueled up. What we're also going to do is start up the EFB tablet, which is the flypad system on the left here. What flypad is, is a simple system that gives you all of your flight information and makes simple calculations to help you with very 20 flying. If this is the first time you're using the aircraft, if you head over to the config page, you can type in your Simbrief username. And then from there, click on the blue from Simbrief button. And that'll then put your basic flight information and your departure and arrival meters onto the home page. If you go to the clipboard, you can also see your aircraft overview, your operational flight plan, which features all the important information you require, such as your fuel on board, cruising altitude and cost index, 
and also a fuel page that lets you fuel the aircraft up. While we're here, we may as well start fueling. So our block from Heathrow is 8765, and this is in kilos by the way, so we'll type in 8765 into the fuel page. Press the play button, and as you can see, fuel will be done in about 6 minutes. Now we're going to head over to the flight management computer and start plugging this in. Now the FMS, or in this case on Nebus aircraft, the MTDU, is not a difficult system to get going, but does take a bit of practice the first time you use it. So what we're going to do is clear any warnings messages that appear, for example in this case flight numbers in use. So we'll clear that until the box is empty, and we'll activate the FMGC. Once we've done that, we'll head over to initialization. And we're going to type in our departure and arrival at Aikau Airports. So Heathrow is Echo Golf Lima Lima. We'll then put a slash in. As you can see, we have a from slash to block slash block. And so use a slash key to just split up two parts of information. And type in our two airports, which is Helsinki Vanta, Echo Foxtrot Hotel Kilo. We'll plug that in. Now the aircraft loads up. We have no flight plans on board, so we'll just click on return. And next, type in our flight number. So in this case, the Finnair flight will be Alpha Yankee, and then flight number 1338. So type in AY1338. So this information you get from your flight plan, as well as any ICAL codes you're flying from and to, and this you'll put into the initialization. Next is the IRS. So if we select the IRS initialization, click on Align on Reference, and confirm it, what that will now do is align the to your reference system of the aircraft. So this essentially combines your GPS with your gyroscopes and aircraft on board computers and as the aircraft to know where it is, when you're moving, where it's going. If we return, we will now put in our cost index, which you know from the tablet system, is 33. So we'll type in 33. And then our flight level it's 370. So once again, we'll type in 370. Once you've done that, we'll head over to the next page. Your zero fuel weight and sense of gravity, the aircraft can do automatically. All you've got to do is press on the button once and twice. And then your block fuel on board is essentially a decimalization of your fuel on board. So in this case, it's thousands, decimal, hundreds. We have 8,000 kilos of fuel on board, decimal 765, so we'll type in 8.765. Input that, it rounds the number to 8.8, .8, and that calculates everything such as your takeoff weights and onboard fuel predictions. Before we go into the flight plan, what we're also going to do is head over to the MCD menu, go to ATSU, AOC menu, weather request, and send. What this does is it gives you a METAR style weather printout of your flight up ahead with your departure and arrival airports. If you keep an eye on the upper ECAM, any second now you should receive a message so that a company message has been received. And once you've got that, we can go back to the AOC menu, go to Receive Messages, open up the new METAR print at whatever time it is, and press on the Print button to print it out. If you look at the lower pedestal now, you can see the printer print out little sheets. What this is, is all of your weather information as seen on screen. So you can click on that when it prints out. Make sure that it all matches, which it does and return over to the flight plan page. Now any flight plan includes four bits of information. You have your departure and arrival airport and runways, your citizen and your stars, your waypoints, and your airways. Your departure and arrival citizen stars essentially is your four letter airport ICAL code, followed by slash and the active runway in use. In this case, it's Echo Lima Lima runway 27 right. Your Sydney or SAR is your routing from the runway to your first waypoint, 
and generally it's your first waypoint followed by a route, in this case Bravo Papakilo 7 Foxtrot. But sometimes, for example in the US, they use separate system stars, but these are always generated to you on your flight plan or give to you as direct. A waypoint is a set of your location that you can fly to and from, and so essentially it creates a flight plan that follows along a dotted map to your destination. And this is either a three or five character letter chain, so there's never a number in this one, only letters. And finally, an airway is a two or four letter or number um, code, and this is essentially daisy chains you're routing together. So it flies VOR to VOR to VOR, links all your waypoints together with a predetermined route that gets you from A to B. Sometimes you'll also see DCT, and what that means is direct. So you skip that and move on to the next one. There's no airway between the two waypoints, so you skip it and move along. So what we're going to do now is plug in our routing. As you see, we've got GPS primary on the bottom now. That means that our IRS is aligned. And you can tell this by our PFD now going to live and our map now also appearing. We can just clear that information and make sure that box is blank. We'll type in our first waypoint, which is Bravo Papa Kilo. And as you can see, we have duplicate names. So there's two waypoints in the world that have the same name. One's 22 miles away, the other 8,000 miles away. So on this occasion, we can make quite an easy guess that this 2022 mile one will be the waypoint we want. But using your flight plan, you can always confirm the latitude and longitude of the certain waypoints. So I'll select that and move on to our next node, which is an airway of Quebec 295. So I'll select that, go to Airways, type in Quebec 295 and paste it into the VIA box. So you go via Quebec 295, type next waypoint, which is Somva. S O M V A. Following Zomva, we now have a direct airway, so we'll insert the flight plan, scroll down to the bottom, and type in Mavas, and paste that information in. You always select the final waypoint as where you're pasting it, as what we'll do is insert that information above where you put it. So, for example, if you want a waypoint between Pavan and Somva, you select the Somva point, but since you want this to be between Somva and our arrival airport, we always paste it on the final waypoint on our list. After the Mavas, we fly direct to Tusca. This gets followed by Ririp. Next we have an airway of November 8501, so select for a rip, go to airways and type in November 851. Now on this occasion it tells me that there's an airway waypoints mismatch. So sometimes if you're using out of date air rack data on Simbrief, your waypoints and airways don't quite match up and sometimes they don't exist. So if you ever see this message or first index or second index not found, all you need to do is just skip that particular waypoint or railway and move on to the next one. So what we'll do is we'll insert the information, clear the message and continue from there. Our next waypoint from RIP is going to be Lakut. So we'll type in L-A-K-U-T. And that will be our final waypoint for Helsinki. So once you finish your flight plan, all you've got to do is click on Insert. Wait for it to turn green. And what you can do is using the plan mode of the ND. We also zoom out, and check the routing, make sure there's nothing problematic on the way. So there's no waypoints that are random locations. There's nothing kind of away from the airport. It all follows the routes and arrives into Helsinki. So I'm happy to fly a plan. We'll return back to the arc page. We can zoom in that if you want to. That's your choice. And it returns the FMS. For one last bit of information. So if you wish to jump back to the very first bit of information, in this case the departure airports, all you've got to do is click on flight plan, so for example you're halfway down, click on flight plan and it automatically resets it to the very top. What we're now going to do is plug in our SID, our standard instrument departure routes. A SID is essentially a predetermined set of waypoints that gets your aircraft from the runway to your first waypoints. 
Now this is done to avoid any airspace restrictions, terrain issues or other traffic, especially in busy airports, and allows ATC to guide your aircraft away from the airport safely and efficiently. So to do this, we're going to select our departure airport of Heathrow, go to departure index, from here we'll type in our departure runway and departure SID. So on this occasion it's runway 27 right, we're going to select for our SID, the Bravo Papahilo 7 Foxtrots. Bravo Papahilo for example, meaning Brooklyn's Park. So you have Brooklyn's Park, you have Crompton, they do mean something, it's just a shortened version of a longer routing. So we'll select the Brooklyn's Park 7 Foxtrot departure, make sure that it gets selected at the top here, insert that, and as you can see, a few more waypoints have now appeared. If you spot this user point here, it's just best to delete it. So you click on the clear button, clear the waypoints, and then insert the flight plan from there. We're almost done now. The final thing we need to do is head over to our performance page and set up our takeoff performance. But before we do that, we need to calculate a few things first. Now this next step can get a little bit complicated, but this isn't too difficult to wrap your head around. What we're going to do is calculate the flex temp of our takeoff. What a flex temp does is it allows you to derate your throttle output on takeoff, therefore slightly reduce your thrust output to extend the engine's life while minimizing the vibrations it has. And so why not quite on toga, not quite on full power? It gives you plenty of power to get off the runway safely, but without shaking the aircraft apart. What we're going to do is use this tool Takeoff Performance Calculator by Ronald Wokovitz. You can find a download link to this tool in the description below. What we're going to do is step by step fill in each box with the information required and that will give us numbers to get the aircraft off the ground. The first we're going to do is select our QNH either in hectopascals or in inches. Hectopascals defaults 1013 and in inches 2992. So depending where you are in the world, rest or America, select the weights for your hectopascals. Once you've done that, you can select your aircraft type which is KCA320. The Heathrow runway length according to charts is 3901 meters. So therefore we'll select the number where that fits, therefore 3801 to 4000. The airport elevation is 78, so we'll be setting that to less than 1000. The wind components right now is 300 at 3 knots, therefore we'll be a headwind at 3 knots, therefore fits the bill with that. You can tell what a headwind and a tailwind is based on your runway heading and your wind heading. If the runway heading is within 180 of the runway heading, therefore it's a headwind. If it's over 180 of the way, that will be a tailwind. So be sure you set the correct head or tail. Generally, you take off into a headwind, but sometimes depending on the requirements, you can go to a tail. But generally, not out of 10, you'll be using a headwind. Outside air temperature at the moment is currently at 18 degrees centigrade, therefore select the temperature between 18. QNH is 1009, so select that. Our takeoff weight, if we refer to our sim brief charts, shows 71996 is our takeoff. 71996. Now do be aware that the takeoff performance calculator does prefer kilos over pounds, and so I recommend as always you use sim brief in kilos, but if you have got it in pounds, just run it through a convergent calculator and that will give you the correct number regardless. Next is flap settings, 9 to that 10 use flaps 1, anti-ice will be turned off, and rubber conditions currently dry. So once you've filled in all the boxes, all you have to do is click on calculate takeoff, and we can see now is you can your v-speeds and your flex temp for your takeoff run. So now that we have our flex temp calculated, we can now populate this page. We'll start off with the flaps, which in 9 times out of 10 will always be flaps 1 for takeoff. You'll only ever use flaps 2 if, for example, you're on a short runway or flying with heavy weights and therefore get a little bit more lift to get off the runway early. But 9 times out of 10, you'll be using flaps 1 for takeoff and place it in there. Next, our flex temp, which you know is 56, so we'll type in 56 and paste it there. And for your V speeds, you can either use the calculated numbers that the tool has given you, or you can just click on each button twice and it populates you with a number. But for this occasion, we'll stick with the calculated numbers of 154, 
155 and 156. And so your V1 is your point of no return. Once you've hit a certain speed or hit a certain part of the runway, regardless of what you do, you must now take off. So if an engine failure, a bird strike, at this point there's too little runway left to slow down, you must take off. Your rotate is when you pull back on the stick and rotate, and your V2 is your speed of safe climb. So once you're at 156, you're safe to continue climbing and get yourself off the runway. Transition altitude is a altitude where you'll switch over from local pressure to standard pressure. So for most of the world, standard altimeter is 1013, and in the US it's 29092. And that determines if you're using hexapascals or inches. So in the UK, most control airspace uses a transition altitude of 6,000, so we'll type in 6,000. For example, the US Canada, they use 18,000 as standard, but always refer to your departure charts, which will tell you what your local transition altitude is. And once you've done that, we are now finished with the FMS. We'll return back to the main view here, and we'll start setting up our autopilots for climb outs and cruise. What we're now going to do is set up our Q&H, our pressure. You can increase the right distance of the panel here using dial on the right. On the left there's backlighting. And so our Q&H we can find on our uh, printout here, which shows Q&H of 1009. Our arrival Q&H is 1017, so you can see that by the Q mark here, Q followed by number. And in the US, you'll get that as a 29 or 30. And switch between the two, you just press on the button behind the pull SCD knob here. So we'll change 1013 to 1009 by scrolling down, and that sets it to local pressure. Now, initial climb will be provided to you by the control tower, or if there's no control tower, you can bring it straight up to your cruising altitude. So in this occasion, as we're not using ATC, we'll go straight up to flight level 370, 37,000 feet. So we use flight levels to determine a set altitude of cruise, because we're using the same pressure, and therefore we can use the same altitude on the marker here. So when you're at a cruise, if you use a tracker that shows you your exact altitude, you'll see that you're a few feet above or below, but essentially flight level 370, with every aircraft using the same pressure, will keep every aircraft at 1000 feet of separation above whatever altitude you're at. As you can see, our flight directors are already active, but essentially when your flight directors on, by clicking on the buttons here to make sure that they're green, and also we'll make sure the speed is set by pressing down on the knob here. Essentially, you want to make sure that's the VNAV and LNAV are all set with the little dots for each bit of information. It's all blank, that's fine. It just means that the aircraft is calculating it automatically and therefore nothing you need to do. With that, we'll return to the overhead panel. As the aircraft has finished fueling, we can turn on the fuel pumps. We can turn on the seatbelt sign. And we can now start the APU, the auxiliary power unit. You can do this by pressing on the master switch button, waiting two or three seconds, and then press the start button. If you look at the lower ECAM, this should then jump to the APU page. And when it does that, you'll notice that it shows the information's flap open, your N gauge increasing, as well as the oil temperature. So if you head to the external view of the aircraft, you can now see that the rear of the aircraft has started up. So the APU is a small engine in the back of the aeroplane that acts in a similar way to GPU in that it powers all the aircraft's primary and backup systems, but without being connected to the GPU, you are now independent of the ground. If you ever go to an airport that doesn't have a GPU, then you can always use the APU as your backup primary source of power. If you return to the cockpits, you can now see that the APU is available, you can also confirm this by using the start button, now showing it's available. Click on the APU bleed, wait a few seconds, and then turn off the external power. At this point, we are now disconnected from the ground and fully independent of ground systems. If we turn the APU page back to the engine page, we are now ready for push and start. So essentially what we're going to do is call the pushback tug onto the aircraft, push in the direction of the runway we're taking off on. So for example, 27 right is going to push to the left hand side, and then 
start up the engines as we're pushing back. So what we're going to do is head back to the overhead panel, turn on our beacon lights to let ground crews that we are ready for engine starts, and using the ATC menu, whichever add-ons you use for pushback, head over to ground services and request the pushback. As you can see, the target will now move into position. The aircraft's beacon lights are flashing, and therefore that's ground crews that we are now ready to start our engines. Therefore, clear the area, clear the space around the aircraft for engine startup. And we're now going to wait for the pushback tug to connect to our nose. Once it has, you'll see the aircraft has got a little bit of pressure being moved to it and start moving slowly. What we're going to do is release the parking brake, which is the little switch down here. Make sure that the engine switch is set to ignition start. Make sure that both sides are clear. And start engine 2 by just moving the switch forward. So as you can see, the engine N1 and N2 have both come to life. On the upper ECAM, the N2 is slowly powered up, as well as the N1. So the engines will now start up, and for external, you can also hear the aircraft starting up as well. Might as well turn the aircraft order at it. Now what we're waiting for is for the N1 to hit around 18 and that will show you when the engine is available once you finish pushback you can just do that disconnect it from either the ATC menu or using shift P on keyboards once you do turn the parking brake back on again Engine 2 is available, so you can now start Engine 1. While Engine 1 is starting, what we're going to do is do a quick flight control test. So switch over to the flight control page, and just move the elevators up and down. Move the ailerons left and right. Kick the rudder left and right. And then bring the spiders up. And down. And so essentially we've just tested all the flight controls make sure everything's working correctly and we'll return back to the engine page and move the flaps down into your takeoff position so on this occasion using flaps 1 we can set the predictive wind shear to automatic we can set the TCAS to Tara but we won't move the switch just yet to automatic as we'll be doing that when we're on the runway so engine 1 is starting. You can now hear the air conditioning come to life. We'll wait for engine 1 to be available. And as soon as it is, we can now turn off the ignition switch back to the centre normal position. And on the overhead, we'll turn off the APU by pressing the APU bleed and the master switch. Also, I'll the cockpit door keep passengers out. At this stage, both engines are active, your flight plan is configured, you can actually see all the parts routes now on the flight plan here. And what you're going to do is back to the overhead, activate the taxi lights, release the parking brake, and increase a tiny amount of throttle to get the aircraft moving. Now you don't have to be putting too much power in, as the A320neo, especially with its larger engines, can start to run away from you. So once you're moving to around 10 knots, reduce the throttle back to idle again, and taxi the rest away on idle throttle, as the aircraft is more than capable to do this on its own. And 
as you taxi to the runway, you're aiming for around 16-17 knots. You'll also notice that your upper ECAM has changed, as it now displays your takeoff checklist. So what you're doing is going through your checklist one by one to make sure that everything's set correctly. So your auto braking is set to max, your cabin signs are currently turned on, your cabin is checked, you can do this by pressing the OR button on the cores overhead. Your spoilers are armed, you can do this by putting on the spoilers lever. Your flap set to take off, in this case flaps position 1. And your takeoff config is tested. You can do this by pressing on the takeoff config button. And with that your pre-takeoff checklist is now complete and you can continue taxi to the runway. Now this checklist must be completed before you're on the runway as this means that your aircraft is now secured and ready to go as soon as you hit your short, your hold short marker. We are now holding short of runway 27 right here at Heathrow. What you're going to do is once you have your takeoff clearance from air traffic control, we're going to activate the landing lights takeoff lights and runway turnoff lights. We're also going to activate the transponder by moving the up switch into the automatic or on position. And just double check our performance takeoff to know that we're rotating at 155 and we'll reduce our throttle at 1580 feet. Once you've confirmed your numbers, we're going to increase a little bit of throttle, taxi onto the runway, and start your takeoff run. Now, on takeoff, it's very important that unless you're set for a toga takeoff, you move the throttle into the flex position. So, this is the second notch on the throttle. So, you have your cruising and climb power and your flex temp. Always keep the throttle so that the notch matches up with flex temp. So, we'll taxi into position on the runway. We can also start the chrono clock as we enter the runway. Hold position. Move the throttle into about 40% of the way there. Check the engines 1 and 2 are stable, which in case they are, they are, so they match up, they're not separate. What we're going to do is move the throttle so the notch moves up into the second flex position. Confirm this with the aircraft showing manual flex on your PFD. Put a little bit of down pressure on the aircraft nose, it's about 100 knots. 100. We'll call out the numbers we pass them. V1 and rotates. And for about 10 to 15 degrees of upwards pitch and take off. Passage 500, gear up. Make a slight round turn to follow our departure path out. And essentially, using the flight director to keep your aircraft on course. Don't forget to also reset your spoilers after takeoff. Part 1400, we'll reduce the throttle back to climb position and also increase our flaps. And once you're off the ground and at a steady rate of climb, what you can do is access the autopilot system. So at this point, the aircraft is now in full control of the aircrafts. There's nothing left for you to do until we hit 10,000 feet. So the aircraft will now start to follow our departure path out to our first waypoint of Bravo Papa Kilo. So the aircraft control our lateral navigation, our LNAV, which is the aircraft turning left and right, and our vertical navigation, our VNAV, which is up and down, as well as airspeed. 
So thrustle's automatic, your heading's automatic, and the aircraft do the rest of its flights on its own. Pass through 5,000 feet. As we pass through 6,000, our standard altimeter will press the stand button. Make sure it reads STD. So that stands for standard. That would be 1013 on the hex pascals. And essentially is a standardized pressure for every aircraft above transition altitude. So if you forget to do it, the aircraft will remind you by having a bit of information down here flashing. Passing through 9,000 feet now. And once you hit 10,000, all you've got to do is switch off the landing lights into the retract position, turn off the turn off lights, and turn off the nose lights. And just like that, you successfully departed an A320neo in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Once you're also at a steady rate of climb and cruise, you can also turn off the T-belt sign and allow passengers to roam around the cabin. And there you have it, you have now successfully taken off the Airbus A320neo. It's again, it's not a very difficult process, it does take a bit of practice. Once you know the basics, the rest of it is pretty much willing to place from there. So I thank you guys for watching the video. If you did find it helpful, then please leave a like and subscribe to the channel too, as it does help us out. And once again, I thank you all for the massive amount of support you've had in recent times, especially around these tutorial videos. I thank you for watching, you take care of yourselves, and wish you many happy virtual hours. Take care, and have a good one. Bye-bye.